Welcome back, friends, to our third and final study of 1 Corinthians 13 in our series on high points in New Testament studies from a Middle Eastern cultural perspective. And the high point we're looking at is the great ethical requirement of love. Now, let's mention just a word about where the vocabulary of the New Testament at this point comes from. The Greek language had a number of words for love. Primary amongst them was, first of all, the word eros, and that word had to do with passionate love. It could be either religious or physical. Then there was another word, phileo, which was the word used ordinarily for the love of family members and friends. And these were the two primary words for love. Religious love, also they used the word eros. And for family and friends, phileo. The New Testament authors looked around for something else. Neither one of those words they, did they find adequate. And so they found a Greek word, a Greek word which wasn't very much used. It occurs quite rarely in Greek literature before the time of the writing of the New Testament. And it meant sort of simply to incline towards. And this is the word agape. And they picked it up, a word which, kind of like uh, an empty bottle or an empty cup, was there in the language, not much meaning to it, and not very often was it found in their literature. But this word, agape, became the primary word for the focus of the entire New Testament. As it were, like great philosophers have always done, it is almost as though the authors of the New Testament, under the guidance of God's Spirit, had to find a new word because they had a new idea. The central thrust of the ethics of the Old Testament and as it had developed in intertestament Judaism was law. How do you find out what it is you're supposed to do? You find out by a finer and finer and finer definition of the rules. And the Jewish community with its rabbis at the time of Jesus were spending their time in doing these things. But with Jesus, we now have a new central focus of what it is that life requires of us. And this is the pattern of love. Here defined in perhaps its finest expression with the one exception of the life of Christ himself. What is Paul doing as he digs up these definitions? He is certainly patterning them after the life of our Lord himself, about which he knew far more then sometimes we give him credit for knowing. He knew the story of the Passion. He knew many of the stories of Jesus. He knew the story of the Resurrection. He knew how Christ had reached out in love to those around him. And this was for him the pattern of life, as he says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. A new word with a new definition, not with abstractions, but with the reality of the dramatic evidence of one man's life the person of Jesus of Nazareth. Now, let's review just for just a minute the structure of this chapter by itself. The chapter by itself has five sections. The first section talks about love and the spiritual gifts. Then Paul defines love positively. He then defines it negatively. He goes back to the definition of love positively. And finally, it closes on a section on the spiritual gifts with a different emphasis. We've moved thus far down past the center, and we've reached this part, this far in our study of the chapter. We notice that at the beginning, Paul talked about two lists of spiritual gifts. One was tongues and knowledge and prophecy, and the second list was faith, hope, and love. And he said, the whole list is worthless without love. And then we'll notice that as he comes just past the center and is now defining love positively, good old faith, hope, and love occur again. Because it says, love believes all and love hopes all. And so faith, hope, and love occur. And of course, at the very end, we'll find that there is faith, hope, and love again. Ordinarily, when we look at that, we, at the passage, we see faith, hope, and love at the end, but we don't notice it anyplace else. In fact, Paul has worked it into his overall passage three times. 
and in each case it is contrasted with tongues, knowledge, and prophecy. Now last time we spoke briefly about love never leaks, and we noticed that again we're using a brass maker's symbol, so there are two primary clusters of symbols in this great chapter. One is the mountain climbing, and we've seen that a number of times, and the other is the brass making symbol, where we saw that there, if there is no love, they're just like the great racket of the brass makers, and now it comes again that love is like a brass bowl. You see, if you hammer too hard on that fancy flowering or those fancy creases or that fancy embellishments on the outside of the brass bowl, as every brass maker will tell you, then it gets too thin and pretty soon a crack develops and then it's going to leak. But no, Paul can tell the brass makers love holds on to confidences and it does not leak. And then as we said briefly in passing last time, love believes all. And we said this is not talking about believing people who tell lies to you, but it's talking about believing God. Now for this, we have to look with a bit more detail to be sure that we understand it, what Paul means when he uses the word believe. For us, belief has to do with intellectual assent to a series of ideas. I trust you have a New Testament with you, and let's take a quick look at a few verses in the book of Romans that we might be able to figure out exactly what Paul means by this tremendous word. The first is in Romans chapter 1, verse 5, through whom, that is Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about obedience of faith. Now, older versions sometimes translated this, to bring about obedience to the faith, but no, there is no word the in the text. This is a Greek genitive. It's obedience of faith, the obedience of faith. And this is a special kind of genitive. Don't let the technical language frighten you. It's a genitive of apposition, which means obedience, which is faith. For Paul, obedience and faith are the same words. Now, how can they be? Look at Romans 14, if you will, and we'll see another case of this. At the very end of, the ch of chapter 14, Paul says, whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. Now, when you think of the word faith and you think of the opposite of it, you probably think of the word unbelief. I mean, faith means you say yes to the mind with a series of ideas, and unbelief means you say no to the mind to the same series, and so the person who has faith is the person who has said yes, and the person without faith is the person who has said no. But that's not true for Paul. Paul says the opposite of faith is sin. Now, does he mean it's a sin not to believe? No. You see, in his mind, the word faith equals the word obedience. Now, if you put obedience down there on the page in front of you, and then you say obedience is the opposite of sin, okay, now it sort of goes into our, you know, we can kind of absorb the data. But we have to see that for Paul it's the same word. Let's try an illustration. Supposing I say to you that I am going to go down on the beach or out in the backyard and sun myself. And that's in the morning I tell you that. In the evening you find me, no sunburn. And you say, what happened, Ken? Did you get too busy? And I say, no, I spent the whole day in the sun, and you know it's a real hot day, but I'm really very busy, and perhaps next week when I'm not quite so busy, I'll get around to the sunburn. Well, now, you know darn well that I'm lying. That's ridiculous. We can say, the rays of the sun strike my face. That's action number one. Action number two is, my face gets red. Okay, intellectually we can say, this happens, then that, but actually they happen at once. And so for Paul, the intellectual assent with the mind and the response of obedience is so totally one act, 
that he can use one word. Sometimes he uses the word believe, and sometimes he uses the word obey. Let's turn on in Romans chapter 15. What does Paul say his task is? Chapter 15, verse 18. For I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has wrought through me to win obedience from the Gentiles by word and deed. You see, he says, my ministry is to win obedience from the Gentiles. You expect him to say, my task is to bring the Gentiles to faith. He doesn't. He says, my task is to bring the Gentiles to obedience. Keep on reading in the same chapter. In verse 31, he's going back to Jerusalem, and he wants to talk about the unbelievers. And sometimes we've translated it that way, that I may be delivered, he says, from the unbelievers in Judea, but the actual work in the, word in the Greek text is that I may be, deliver, be, may be delivered from the disobedient in Judea. You see, the things I believe are the things I act upon. You see, I say to myself, well, Ken, I believe I should lose 10 pounds and shouldn't have a dish of ice cream at 10 o'clock at night. But usually, if there's any ice cream available, I have a little nip or two. Now, that means I don't really believe it. If I believed it, I would act upon it. I'm just kidding myself when I say I want to lose 10 pounds. What I mean is, I'd like to believe that, but I don't really. You believe the things you act upon, and you act upon the things you believe. The sunburn and the sun have got to come together, or they're not, nothing is really happening. Okay, and then we get to the end of chapter 16, and we have exactly the same thing in which Paul talks about, according to the command of the eternal God to bring about the obedience of faith, sometimes mistranslated to bring about the obedience to the faith. Of course there's intellectual assent. Of course we can talk about the faith, which Paul does at the end of the first chapter in Galatians. He talks about the faith, meaning sort of a set of ideas, uh, something that you can look at and say yes to or say no to. But when he gets to the practicalities of life, faith and obedience become one. And this is what James is talking about. In all due respect to the great Luther, James and Paul are not in disagreement. James is talking about somebody who's managed to separate these out and decided he could say yes with the mind and not obey. And James says, no way, that's not faith, that's intellectualizations. And in the second chapter of James, all you have to do is put intellectualizations every time the, James says the word faith, and you'll find that what he says is in complete harmony with what Paul writes. All right, back to 1 Corinthians 13. Faith, sorry, love believes all Therefore, love accepts intellectually all the truth of God, and love obeys in all things, even the costly walk of obedience that love at times requires of us. Paul is saying both of these. You know, I think every believer at some point makes a very basic decision about the revelation of God in the Scriptures. I talk to a lot of people in university circles who themselves have sympathies to the Christian faith, or perhaps they're deeply committed to it in their own way. And when I find when the, the way they look at the New Testament is sort of the behavioral sciences really give us pure truth. And of course, they're in process. And so further research will give us further insight of the nature of the human person and the human predicament. And isn't it quaint and interesting and uh, very encouraging that some of the authors of the New Testament had psychological insights that are in harmony with what some of our psychologists and behavioral sciences, scientists are telling us. And the people who talk that way usually mean by that, whenever Paul doesn't agree with the last word of the behavioral sciences, well, that's too bad for poor Paul. As long as uh, when we talk that way, then our final authority is, in fact, the behavioral sciences. Paul says, love believes all things. All of God's truth we accept, properly understood, 
as truth for us. Love hopes all things, and we're talking now about the future hope of the Christian as we look forward to the last great day in which all of us will be together with Christ and with all those who have gone before us in the great banquet with the Messiah. And finally, we are told love patiently endures all things. We've spoken of this briefly, but let's focus on it a bit more. Sometimes love requires of us a very high price. I have a friend. He has been a friend of mine for 25 years, and he is the bishop of the Episcopal Church of Tehran, Iran. His church has had a hard time since the changes in Iran. And a little over two years ago, some group, without, we believe, the approval of the government, but nevertheless, some radical fringe group decided that this bishop, this Christian bishop, bishop should be killed. He tried to kill him and failed. The second time, they tried harder. Two men came in the night. Three o'clock in the morning, they burst into the bishop's bedroom. They fired five shots into his bed. His wife threw herself across his bed, across himself, trying to protect him. And there was one bullet through her hand, but other than that, all five bullets went into his pillow and missed his head. He thought it was the end when he saw the muzzle of the gun in the, in the uh, darkness of the night. And to his amazement, he found himself, after the firing of these shots, still alive. After that, the Episcopal Iranian community insisted that their bishop leave. He didn't want to. He said, this is, these are my people, and I am the shepherd, and I cannot leave this tiny flock. They pressed him and insisted that he must go. By this time, he, he agreed and left. And after he left, a group broke in and beat up his secretary and almost strangled her, but fortunately she survived. His wife decided that she must go back to encourage the community there, and she was seated beside the secretary who had almost lost her life, and the, the husband, the bishop, was at a meeting in Cyprus. And on that day, the 6th of May, 1980, their only son, who had finished a degree at Cambridge and was a professor at Tehran University, was driving home to his home in the suburbs in Tehran in his own private car. He was stopped at a red light, gunman got into the car, and he was killed. They failed to kill the father, and so they murdered his son. The community called up the bishop in Cyprus and told him of the tragedy of the event and asked him if he would like to say anything at the funeral, perhaps some words that he could dictate over the phone. He said, give me the night to pray. The next morning, he wrote a prayer and dictated it in Persian to the people in Tehran to be read at the funeral of his son that afternoon. When he first got the news, he wrote some Persian poetry in his diary, and I can't remember all of it, but two of the lines were something like this. Do not measure life by gain, but by loss. Do not measure life by the wine drunk, but by the wine poured out. And here is his prayer. Bishop Hassan Dehkani Tafti, Bishop of the Episcopal Church of Jerusalem and the Near East, and Bishop in Iran, Cyprus, May 6, 1980 a father's prayer upon the murder of his son. O oh God, we remember not only Bahram, but also his murderers, not because they killed him in the prime of his youth and made our hearts bleed and our tears flow, not because with this savage act they have brought further disgrace on the name of our country among the civilized nations of the world, but because through their crime 
we now follow in thy footsteps more closely in the way of sacrifice. The terrible fire of this calamity burns up all selfishness and possessiveness in us. Its flame reveals the depth of depravity and meanness and suspicion, the dimension of hatred and the measure of sinfulness in human nature. It makes obvious, as never before, our need to trust in God's love as shown in the cross of Jesus and his resurrection. Love which makes us free from hate toward our persecutors. Love which brings patience, forbearance, courage, loyalty, humility, generosity, greatness of heart. Love which more than ever deepens our trust in God's final victory and his eternal designs for the church and for the world. Love which teaches us how to prepare ourselves to face our own day of death. O oh God, Bahram's blood has multiplied the fruit of the Spirit in the soil of our souls. So when the murderers stand before thee on the day of judgment, remember the fruit of the Spirit by which they have enriched our lives and forgive. The bishop has written a book. It's called The Hard Awakening. And he takes a line from a Persian poet which says, At first love is such an easy thing, but oh, the hard awakening. If we are able in our lives to fill out the definitions of love in the central affirmation of this great hymn, we will be reaching out to the levels which Bishop Hassan Dehkani Tafti, one of the great Christian spirits of the 20th century, has shown to us in his patiently enduring all things. I personally, through this last three months, have been privileged to be a part of a very patient, suffering community in West Beirut that has seen thousands of their people die and their homes destroyed and their world collapsing and their factories burned and their schools in rubble and their churches in ruins. And we too have seen people who have discovered the hard awakening. All right. After these definitions, Paul then turns at the end and he gives us the last scene of this great, beautiful, and incomparable hymn. The scene in which he tells us now of love and the spiritual gifts, again returning to the theme with which this great hymn began. And so let us look on our chart here. If you can read it, fine. If you can't, I hope you can notice the indentations and follow along as we go with the sheet in front of you. Again, prophecy, tongues, and knowledge are now in contrast with faith, hope, and love, a contrast that we have seen now three times. The second theme is primarily knowledge, in this case prophecy included, and the end of all things. When the perfect comes, we are told, the imperfect, the fragmentary, will be discarded. This theme of the imperfect nature of knowledge is repeated at the bottom and how then when that great day comes, knowledge will pass away in the light of the perfection that will come in the face of Christ. And right in the middle, Paul gives us a little parable. And the parable is to inform the other themes in this little stanza which uses inverted parallelism. <clears throat> 
And here the parable is the parable of the child and of the man. So with the inverted nature of these five semantic units in mind, let us quickly go through the text as we have it. First of all, we're told that love never falls. All right? We talked about the mountain climbing image, and we discover now that prophecy is going to be discarded and tongues will cease. Tongues are not the language of heaven, for this language will die out, we are told, and that knowledge is going to be discarded. Here I am as a New Testament scholar spending my life in the, the acquiring and the, and the writing down and the publication and in the broadcasting and in the dissemination of knowledge and all of those libraries and all of those books and all of that stuff that I'm spending my life in one day are going to pass away. And I, trying to be in my little way a scholar, have to remember that. And all of us must remember it. The second stanza tells us of how the knowledge is imperfect because when the perfect comes, you don't need the imperfect and it's going to be gone. The third stanza, as we noted, was the stanza about the child and the man. Now what's this all about? Paul, I don't think, is talking about when he was a little boy. And what's this bit about the reasoning and the speaking and the thinking? Well, what's this got to do with the material around it? It only makes sense when we see the inverted stanzas of this last unit. We just looked at them, and we saw that, lo that knowledge, prophecy, and tongues are at the beginning, and that faith, hope, and love are at the end, and then we saw two stanzas on knowledge and the end of all things and the parable in the middle. What's he talking about? The word child here is the word that Paul uses for an immature Christian, and he's just called the Christians in Corinth children. He doesn't mean a little boy. He means somebody that hasn't grown up to understand the deep things of God. And so the man means someone who has now matured in his understanding of Christian truth. So what Paul is saying, you see, this is probably the year 51 or 52, and Paul became a Christian about the year 32 or 33. He's been a Christian almost 20 years. And what he's saying is, when I was first a Christian, back in the early days of my faith, I was a big polemical boxer. I was ready to argue about tongues and to split that theological data down and argue about knowledge and be sure you had your theology straight, and I was ready to punch you in the nose if you didn't declare your faith exactly the way I do. For me, the big things then were the understanding of the mysteries of God through prophetic speech and the ability to speak in tongues and to hammer out the right theology and knowledge, and I was ready to take on the world. But he says, that was back when I didn't know what I now know. Now, he says, I'm matured more. I've become a man. And I now know that faith, hope, and love are the things that really matter. And the, the spiritual gifts that are the lesser gifts and the spiritual gifts that are the more important ones is the point that he's making. As a child, I fought over these. As a man, I now seek out with all that is within me the higher gifts of faith, hope, and love. And then as he closes at the end, we have this marvelous image of the mirror, the brass makers, remember? And the brass makers are the people who make all the brass work for most of Greece and half of the Greco-Roman world. And there was a statue of Athena standing right there in the middle, sorry, Aphrodite, standing in the middle of the Acropolis in Corinth, and she was standing with her, her a helmet in one hand and a, a bronze mirror on the other hand that was polished as a mirror where actually it was uh, a shield. And so she's looking at herself in this shield that's polished as a mirror. Now what happened for the people who made mirrors in the first century was that they would, before you order the mirror, of course it's made of brass or bronze, they would ask you who your gods were, and then they would carefully etch on the face of the mirror the gods whom you worshipped. And so you could get up in the morning and you could look in the mirror and, ah, very nice. You could see your face amongst the gods. Dimly, though, it's in a mirror. 
And so Paul is saying, look, you mirror makers, you bronze workers, you know that you etch the gods for all of your customers. And so now we try to understand the nature of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and we struggle to discover it. But it's, it's in a mirror. We, you know, you really don't figure out what the God is like because it's a, just a sort of a fainted image in a mirror. But he says, then the mirror will be gone. And we will discover not that we are trying to understand an idea, a concept, but there is a face. The knowledge of God is the knowledge of a person, and that person has come to us and revealed God to us in Christ. The mirror will disappear, and we will see and be known even as we know. And now we've got faith, hope, and love. But the highest, the great exhilarating vision of the mountain climber, the one for which a high price must be paid, and when it is paid, enormous benefit is available. That great pass, as Hassan Dehkani Tafti discovered it, in the radiance of his personality, as I have seen him in the, as he has gone through and reached beyond the tragedy of the death of his son. That great height is love.